Hey everyone, we know how hard it can be to keep up with the latest news in Israel, so if you haven't had the time to stay on top of what's what in the Holy Land, have no worries. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and this is ILTV's Weekly Review. Conflict with Iran is boiling, and the international community seems to be cracking down on the regime in Tehran from every angle. Militarily, Saudi news network Al Arabiya reports explosions in eastern Syria as warplanes hit several alleged weapons storehouses connected to the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. And the attacks near Al Bukamal Airport mark an area that's been hit many times for hosting Iranian forces, including strikes by Israel. But when asked about the strikes during a press briefing in Lisbon, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu simply remarks, I never talk about that. That said, Netanyahu is praising the sanctions and other actions taken against Iran. Iran's aggression is growing, but its uh, empire is tottering. And I say, let's make it totter even further. Also, Netanyahu arrived in Portugal for meetings with United States Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, where the two discussed Iran and other regional developments. First of all, I'm delighted uh, again to see Secretary Pompeo. Uh, the first subject that I will raise is Iran. The sub second subject is Iran, and so is the third, and many more. But uh, I think that we have been fortunate that, that President Trump has led a consistent policy of pressure against Iran. Iran is increasing its aggression as we speak, even today. Netanyahu also takes credit for preventing a meeting between United States President Donald Trump and Iranian President Rouhani in September. Though Rouhani has recently alleged that his only obstacle to meeting with President Trump is the United States sanctions against Iran. Meanwhile, diplomatically speaking, the UK, France and Germany are now taking a tougher stance on the Ayatollahs in condemning Iran's development of nuclear-capable ballistic missiles. The trio says that this goes against UNSC resolutions calling on Tehran not to pursue such technology and that Iran's ballistics activity is inconsistent with previous endorsements of the JCPOA. Now let's move back to Canada, where McGill University Provost has now condemned the student council for the targeting of Jewish council member Jordan Wright. Wright was threatened with impeachment for accepting a free trip to Israel from Hillel of Montreal, but while the student council may be walking back its statements, it certainly isn't apologetic. And here now to discuss is the head of the Israel desk at NGO Monitor, Itai Rouveni. Itai, thank you for being with us now. Thank you. We, how common are incidents like this and, and what's driving them? So many people will say what's driving those incidents in the campuses specifically is just Baltant anti-Semitic uh, ideology uh, mixed with some, uh, uh, you know, uh, ideologies that try to uh, save the world and free the world from the uh, totalitarian regimes. Israel, mm. this is how they consider the, the worst regime in the world. And we see young people with zero um, knowledge on the conflict, just just walking after those powerful NGOs that work that's working in the campuses in order to mobilize them, to hate everything that deal with Israel and the Jews. So how common are incidents like these, though? I think I, is, this, a, is this I mean is this a growing issue? Because here we see on the one hand, for example, the McGill incident. Then we also have in Oberlin College now, a, you know, a monument by SJP and, yeah, yeah. and you, JVP you, to, to the terrorists. You uh, have a list. It's a list. Every day there is an incident, a different incident in a different campus. And by the way, it doesn't matter if it's coming from the right or from the left. Just the, the, what matters is the result. Targeted right. Jews. And, for, and to, to answer your question, when we, when we look at it, when you're zooming out, look all, in all the situation, or specifically on the liberal campuses, we can see that it's a fruitful ground the authorities do nothing to prevent it. Uh, they justifying the, the, the most of the time the, the, the incidents, free speech. It's inside the university. It's part of the university charter. Uh, let the let the students uh, solve their problems, things like that. But what we see is a growing um, phenomena that no one have the, the real solution in order to, to the Jews and Israelis will feel, feel safe in the campuses. Well, I think it's you know, ironic that the, that the argument is free speech, but meanwhile they're using that argument to infringe on the free speech no, of, of the Jews on the campus. Of course. Um, so what, Israel, what is Israel doing to fight this sort of uh, the, this growing trend? Uh, is there anything Israel really can do from afar? So I think the solution, and it is not to go only to North America, but also for the situation in Europe, which is more violent in a way, in, in, in the streets, is that it's, it's have to, it has to come from two sides, from bottom up and from the authorities, from the policy uh, level. For example, 
we had a, we had a vote in the French parliament, the French lower uh, yeah. parliament, that recognized the IRA definition, the definition of anti-Semitism, the working definition. Uh, so this is from, from up. And from down, we should invest more money, more um, human capital on the people on the ground, the students, the students that, that, that provide them tools, sure. provide them tools to know who are those powerful NGOs that are uh, that people walking uh, after. With respect to the, you know, from above aspect, you know, you, you mentioned France, for example, which is perfect for, for this, you know, is it possible that that's maybe even causing more harm than, than good? Because, for example, we see now the old, one of the only Jewish members of parliament in France now is getting death threats after the passage of, of this new uh, resolution. Yeah, so the, I think the argument of it's causing uh, more damage is not, um, has nothing to do with the reality. The reality is that no one until now was able to define what is anti-Semitism, what is modern anti-Semitism. And this lack of definition caused problems mainly to the Jewish communities all over the world, from the West Coast in the US until East Europe, yeah. and, and even in other places in Asia and Africa, it's a problem. And we need to define what is anti-Semitism. Only then we can provide the solutions, whether right. it's up or down. Itai, thank you very much. For thank you very us. much. We have some very interesting news from France. Reports of anti-Semitic incidents have been continuing to rise in the European country. And now French officials are taking action. That's right, France has just passed legislation that now calls hate of Israel a form of anti-Semitism. In a vote of 154 in support to 72 against, the lower house of France's parliament has now approved a draft resolution that officially decrees anti-Israel hate to be a form of anti-Semitism. It also calls on the French government to join other EU nations in adopting the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, which also states that some forms of hatred against Israel, like comparing the state of Israel to Nazi Germany, are also examples of anti-Semitism. While well, Israeli officials and pro-Israel groups like the AJC and CRIF are, or France's Central Jewish Umbrella Group, are all lauding the decision, especially since anti-Semitic hate crimes account for nearly half of the hate crimes in France, despite Jews only making up 3% of the population. This latest legislation comes just as over 100 Jewish gravestones in eastern France were discovered vandalized with swastikas. Police have now opened an investigation. Once again, the United Nations is preparing to weigh in on multiple resolutions against Israel put forth by the Palestinian Authority. And amongst them is one resolution in support of the Palestinians' right of return. But in stark contrast to the typical, Israel's ambassador to the United Nations is today announcing plans to advance a resolution recognizing Jewish refugees from Arab countries, too. Nearly 800,000 Jews are estimated to have fled Arab countries in the last century due to pogroms and other discriminatory government policies. Uh, and speaking to the UN, Ambassador Dani Danon explains that the international community, like so often, is comfortable focusing only on Palestinian refugees while, quote, erasing the story of hundreds of thousands of Jews from the history pages. But Israel will voice the truth and correct this historical inju injustice, he continues. Now, does Dan Danon expect this resolution to actually be adopted? Probably not. But either way, it does speak to a larger supposed hypocrisy at work at the United Nations. Namely, that Jewish refugees have since settled in Israel and elsewhere, but have never been recognized as peoples forced from their homelands, meaning their migration is essentially looked at as voluntary. Meanwhile, the estimated 750,000 Palestinian refugees from 1948 mostly left Israeli cities at the behest of invading Arab countries. Yet decades after their resettlement in Syria, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, and elsewhere, they, their children, and even their grandchildren all enjoy refugee status while demanding the return to the lands they abandoned. In other news, Israel doesn't always get recognized for helping other countries during their times of need. That hasn't stopped the Jewish state from helping out anyway, and ILTV's Shanna Fold is here now with the story on the latest rescue crew that Israel has sent to Europe. Early this morning, the IDF announced that it's sending off aid to Albania following an earthquake that quite literally rattled the country. 51 are dead and thousands are injured with the November 26 earthquake's magnitude measuring a 6.4 out of 10. And it's now affecting 1.9 million people of the country's 2.8 million population. But the IDF is doing what it can to help on the ground. The IDF team consists of 10 regular and reserve troops that will be surveying buildings to see if they're still structurally safe 
following the tremor. And the Israeli team's home front command and foreign ministry are also helping to manage the disaster by advising the local authorities in Albania on how to respond. Israel isn't the only country lending a hand, though. Albania's defense minister says 780 rescuers came to the scene from all around the globe. And Bebi Rexa, a U.S. singer-songwriter, has even flown in. Being of Albanian descent, the star has raised money through her fan base to help the country get back on its feet. Meanwhile, investigators in Albania are looking to blame the quake's damages on any possible illegal construction, as poor building structures and code violations are considered to be the top contributors to the massive destruction. But coming back to the Jewish state now, though Israel may be as small as the state of New Jersey, it has a history of reaching out after large natural disasters and helping in a big way. Following a Mexican disaster in 2017, Israel helped find survivors and missing people while also surveying 158 buildings, schools, hospitals, and government offices to make sure they were sturdy enough following the earthquake. Then, Israel aided Brazil in September of this year when the country battled massive wildfires throughout the Amazon rainforest. And the IDF also sent 130 people when the Manai Gerais dam collapsed in January 2019. In fact, the Holy Land was even the first on scene in January 2010 when a massive earthquake hit Haiti, paralyzing it until today. And likewise in 2011 when Japan faced a crippling earthquake as well. In 2004, Israel also sent aid to the U.S. following Hurricane Katrina and to Indonesia to help recover from the tsunami that wiped out communities in both Indonesia and Sri Lanka. Moving on, shocking accusations of anti-Semitism and discrimination on campus in Canada are now making their way across the media. A university student in Canada is now being forced to resign from her student government position because she's going on a visit to Israel. The Canadian Jewish Advocacy Group is now instead coming down in the Legislative Council at McGill University in Montreal, though, after they took a vote asking Jordan Wright to remove herself from the committee over her planned participation in the trip. The trip in question is called Face to Face, and it's organized by the Hillel of Montreal. And the visit brings students to meet with both journalists, politicians, and locals from both Israel and Palestinian territories to better understand the nuanced conflict. But only Jordan was singled out for going. Wright says that other students who were going to join the trip who are not Jewish were not addressed, let alone asked to step down. But still, the committee says that Wright must either pull out of the trip or resign. Wright, on the other hand, has vowed to resist the measure, and she went on to say that this is not the first time Jewish students were bullied out of student government at McGill. In 2017, a Jewish student was removed from the university's student government for his mere involvement in Jewish life on campus. But that same year, a student and representative also on the board named Igor Sadikov called for violence on campus when he tweeted out, Punch a Zionist today. And when a motion was brought forward to remove Sadikov from his representative seat following the incitement and several other racist comments, students voted to keep him on board in a 5-4 to four decision. It's not yet clear how McGill will respond to this latest student council action. Moving on, if you live in Israel and things seemed calm to you in late November while 500 rockets and mortars rained down from the Gaza Strip, there's a reason for that. Until the summer of 2019, Israel's rocket alert system was divided into 250 areas across the country. And that meant that even neighborhoods out of harm's way would receive alerts as long as they were in the zone. So the way things worked before, Israelis would often be interrupted several times a day during tense times, and often for no good reason. And this is not only a detriment to work and productivity, but it of course causes people to go through unnecessary panic, which can easily result in injury. In the recent clashes with Gaza, for example, 34 people were hurt just running to the bomb shelters. But professionals now believe that that number would have been much higher had it not been for the new system. The IDF installed a new alert system over the summer that makes sirens more specific to location, and the IDF has also made that alert system more available for private citizens who just need to download the app in order to hear the sirens. So no more needless alerts, and next up, the IDF hopes to install the alert system into smart TVs too. Ten years ago, a Jewish infant from Afula, Israel, was orphaned by terror. But despite losing both parents to a heinous terrorist attack in Mumbai, India, Moshe Holtzberg is today celebrating coming of age with his bar mitzvah, and all of Israel is watching. Mazal tov, Moshe. Mazal tov, im ergeacha le mitzvot. Ze meod meregesh otano. Ani tragashti, kshe pagashti otcha be Mumbai, v'achakach 
רעייתי פגשה אותך במטוס, מזל טוב לסבתות ולסבים, איזה רגע עצום זה. אנחנו יודעים איזה טרגדיה עברתם, אנחנו תמיד זוכרים איך סנדרה חילצה אותך והגנה עליך, אנחנו לא שוכחים אף פעם את סנדרה. ואנחנו יודעים שבתוך הטרגדיה הזאת יש חיים, ויש תקומה, ויש מצוות, ואתה בא עכשיו באמת... עם אהבה של כל עם ישראל וכל אזרחי ישראל, ורבים רבים מחוץ לישראל. לכן אני רוצה לאחל לך שתהיה בן נאמן לעמך, לארצך, למשפחתך, ושתמשיך בחיים טובים ומאושרים. מזל טוב, מוישי. מזל טוב, מוישי, ולכל המשפחה היקרה שלך. אנחנו יודעים שעברת אסון גדול בגיל שנתיים. אתה בעצם מגיל שנתיים נלחם יום-יום להמשיך את החיים. אבל אתה עטוף בהרבה אהבה של הסבים והסבתות, כל המשפחה שלך ושל המטפלת שטיפלה בך ומטפלת בך ואיתכם עד היום. אבל אתה יודע שכל עם ישראל איתכם. And now here to tell us more about this incredible but delicate story is ILTV's Shanna Fold. Shanna, thank you so much for being with us. Now, can you give us a little bit back, about, of background here? You know, many kids in Israel have their bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah. You know, why is this one so different? Well, unfortunately, a lot of kids who have their um, bar mitzvah are not still in post-traumatic stress from a terrorist attack that claimed the life of both parents. So this was special, and I think that we... So let me give you a little bit of background. Moshe was just two years old when he was rescued from a terrorist attack in Mumbai. His parents ran a Chabad house in Mumbai, India, which is a place where travelers and Jews can come and be Jews when they're abroad, when they're not in densely populated places um, that might have a lot of Jews. So, so I, some Pakistani terrorists came in and shot the place up, and luckily for Moshe, he was rescued by his nanny. So this is the background there on why it's sort of momentous that he made it to this moment of manhood. Why, and why he's definitely in the spotlight, you know, with this coming of age, because this is a huge change from going, it's, a, it's almost like a transformation story, you know, where you're, where you're going from this kind of victim into this adult and he sort of And he made it. He made it through it, these yeah. years, and, and he's um, taking a milestone that most Jews yeah. get, to, get to do, so it's very and special. So has, have Israelis been kind of following his life since two years old, or really kind of are they just tuning in back now? So people have been following him. Actually, last year, um, he got some attention from the prime minister. He spoke about wanting to open a Chabad house of his own back in Mumbai. He also got attention from the PM of India. Now, I just want to draw our attention to some of the bar mitzvah pictures. Sure. Um, he got a lot of shout outs. He celebrated. He had a lot of love. Um, there was a letter actually from the White House in the United States. Really? Wow, so everybody's really paying attention to this. Everyone really paid attention to this. I wanted to just read one line from the letter. Please. It was a brief letter. Um, May your faith continue to guide, strengthen, and comfort you throughout your life. I thought that was really special and sweet. It's not, it's, it's sweet, it's short and sweet and to the point. That it's was just, nice. that was just one of the lines I picked out and um, Prime Minister Modi also wrote a letter to him uh, and the terrorist attack actually was on November 26th of 2008. Wow, so so really it's, it's in well. close proximity. Wow, all right, well, this was such an incredible event. Uh, everybody's been paying attention to it and uh, it's very special. Shanna, thank you for sharing with You're us. You're welcome. And up now, we have ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh here with this week's Entertainment Rundown. Hey guys, so the first story I'm here to share with you is about Israel's very own WeWork founder, Adam Newman. Two production companies have apparently teamed up to make a film about the Israeli entrepreneur in the wake of him being ousted from his company and its ultimate dramatic uh, implosion. Oh wow, yeah, no, the whole WeWork situation has yeah. been going pretty crazy in the news lately. I, I feel like it's already been some kind of reality TV show yeah. uh, you know, today. And I feel like every day we're hearing something new about this company. So how soon are we actually going to be seeing this movie? Is there a trailer? Or? Right. So Universal and Bloomhouse Production and Academy Award winning screenwriter Charles uh, Randolph have fast tracked the film and it's going to be based around the book by Katrina Brooker, who is the journalist that conducted an in-depth reporting on the company and Newman's outsting. It also discusses, of course, the relationship between Newman and the CEO of the Japanese holding company, SoftBank, that actually took over WeWork. All right. So just for those who haven't been keeping up with the story, Adam Newman was actually forced out uh, of his chief exec as chief executive of WeWork back in September right. uh, as the company's value plummeted and SoftBank uh, Unlimited 
invested billions in WeWork and closed a deal to get 80% ownership right. of the company. And, and that deal ended up costing them actually billions yeah. of dollars. It looks like Lots they're missing Newman. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because I wasn't actually aware that Newman was actually really heavily involved in the Kabbalah movement. And he ended up incorporating a lot of that, a lot of its teaching into the office culture, which is super interesting. But basically, we're going to have to wait and see the movie because there's obviously so much more to this story than, so uh, than we even know. So what's up next? Okay, so up next, the extremely talented and beyond lovely Israeli couple, Yuda and Maya Deville, have been creating charming and hilarious web comics mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. their relationship since 2016 called One of Those Days, which has become and is super popular with over 5 million followers on Instagram. The two have recently won the most creative content maker award Award at the 2019 Inflow Global Summit Awards. Yeah, I mean, they came onto Israel in Style not long ago, they and did. I know I personally have been following yep. them for so long. Same. It's hilarious. You can relate to literally every single one of their comments, uh, their comics, sorry. And what's interesting is that it first started out with them talking more about their marriage, but now they just had a kid, right? Yeah, they just welcomed their first child not long ago. And I guess having a baby really is very time consuming, yes. which apparently, apparently we weren't <laughs> thinking about. They didn't even know they were up for the award until they actually won the award, <laughs> beating out over 150 influencers from all over the world. So huge congrats to That's them. Incredible. And obviously, you know, Mazal yeah. on the baby. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and I, I feel like they started posting less because of the baby as well, which would make me yeah, I mean, it makes I sense, them, but yeah, but their images are still amazing. Yeah. So. Very exciting news. Thanks for the entertainment round down, Emmanuel. Of course. Have you ever seen the video footage of the emergency plane landing on the Hudson River in New York? Well, it's chilling, and it could make you nervous to fly, but thanks to a new Israeli technology, engine failure might be avoided. Airplane engine failure is no joke. If you remember, in 2009, Captain Chelsea Sullenberger was able to bring all of his 155 passengers to safety when he completed an emergency landing on the Hudson River. Both the plane's generators were affected by a flock of unforeseen geese flying into airspace. New technology coming out of Israel's Technion can now monitor a plane's trajectory to see if it's losing altitude and also to see if there are any potential obstacles that might get in the way. The algorithm was just recently tested and can now be integrated into the cockpits of small aircraft and drones. In a simulation using a four-seat aircraft, a plane assumed engine failure while flying over the Galilean Israel's north. The algorithm found the best landing strip available and showed the cues on the screen to help navigate there. The technology aims to make things easy for pilots who are undergoing immense stress. And some of the research for the revolutionary technology was supported by the Israeli Ministry of Defense. The research team behind the development says the algorithm can be adopted into general aviation aircraft cockpits and even unmanned ones. That's it for ILTV's weekly review. See you next week.